I'm very, very happy uh, to host this event here tonight uh, for a variety of reasons. The first one is the personal um, tie of friendship and respect that connects me to jo Joseph Shorat. It has been like that for a long time in two uh, neighboring and very close institutions like Casa Italiana and the Calandra Institute, uh, for which uh, Joseph is the director of uh, public events and uh, coordinates many of the cultural outreach programs that the Calandra does in cooperation with its dean, Anthony Tamburi. And also the opportunity to have uh, Laura Ruberto here, but also for the specific topic that they um, discuss in these two uh, books that are collections of essays that they edited. It's a very timely, very important topic of discussion, New Italian Migrations. Um, for the states, because the book concentrates on the phenomenon of Italian migration to the U.S. Uh, after 1945, so after, as you know, the first big wave of immigration, 1880-1920, during which about 5 million Italians, mostly from the south, left Italy. Um, this is a much less discussed, but not less important, uh, period of Italian immigration, of course, with completely different characteristics, and the books um, are two, as I told you. The first one deals with the uh, political and historical aspects of these migration, and the other one with the cultural and artistic aspects. And I think that's probably the, the one in which I found more stimulating um, examples, because it really concentrates on the artistic and cultural production that these uh, people coming from Italy have produced and with which they contributed also to the uh, larger cultural and artistic life of this country. And why is this relevant today? As you know, there is uh, a lot of discussion in Italy about migrations, and there are many movements and parties that present the immigration crisis in Italy as the fundamental problem with which Italy has to come to terms. When you look at the numbers, uh, we are dealing with a few thousand people uh, coming mostly from the north shores of Africa in rather desperate conditions that almost never decide then to establish a residence in Italy. So f uh, from a larger point of view, from, the, from a greater um, visual, it's really an irrelevant demographically uh, phenomenon. But it's presented, as it very often happens, as a um, cause of all the economic and social problems that exist in Italy today. And is, this immigration phobia also doesn't deal with another very important aspect of Italy's demographic today. That is the fact that Italy right now is the eighth country in the world today to produce immigrants, people that leave the country to move somewhere else, the eighth. It means immediately after Mexico and before Vietnam. So the fact that these two phenomena, the phenomenon that is very limited in number of immigration from Northern Africa, and the phenomenon of the emigration of Italians to other countries are never connected, that nobody ever talks about these figures and puts them black and white and puts them at the center of the political discussion, contributes to create the myth of immigration as a problem, as an issue and not as a form of enrichment for society in general. And these two books very much go in that direction. They look at, it's not a, a rosy presentation, it's not that they're advocating any uh, form of uh, uh, general happiness about immigration, but it, it looks at the numbers, it looks at the individual stories, it looks at the contribution that these specific group of immigrants have brought to the country in which they moved. So for all these reasons, I'm very, very happy to uh, have a chance to discuss uh, with the curators of these two volumes um, the books New Italian Migration to the United States and to welcome Joe Shora and Laura Roberto to Casa Italiana. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Stefano, again, um, for that wonderful presentation um, and introduction. 
I, I say this, this is not the first time that I've been invited to present at Calandra, at the uh, Casa Italiana. Hey, how are you doing? Um, and I'm always excited to be here because Casa Italiana, under the direction of Stefano Albertini, has opened its doors um, to the Italian American community, to members of the Italian diaspora at large, and has understood that Italian history and culture is not simply what happens inside the borders of the nation state of Italy. And that Italian culture is something that's happening in Buenos Aires, that's happening in, in, in Hamburg, and it's happening in, in other places throughout, um, um, the United, the, throughout the world. And he understands that fundamentally. And for that reason, we owe him really a real debt of gratitude. So um, this book, began somewhere, we were, we've been thinking about how long it's taken to get us to this book. And we started first thinking about it somewhere around 2007, 2008. And it was in 2009 that we first put out the call for papers for people to um, suggest uh, their ideas for contributions to this edited collection. So it's taken us a very, very long time um, to get these books into print. They came out last year in 2017. Lauda is from California, I'm here in New York City, and the ways in which we collaborated on this project in terms of coming up with the ideas for it, for editing the, um, the various essays that were contributed, to making the selections, to writing the various introductions, was something that happened virtually for all intents and purposes um, over Skype, over email, and occasionally meeting one-to-one um, um, -to, -one to discuss some of the issues that were uh, part of bringing this book together. So what we'd like to do in keeping with that, the give and take that we experienced, it's not to um, impose on you the sort of uh, the difficulties of that. What we'd like to do though is to take turns today um, presenting the books. Um, I'll speak a little bit, then Lauda will, and then um, we'll go back and forth for a little while. So again and again, the standard studies of Italian American history and culture take as their starting point the late 19th century and the early 20th century in the United States and see immigration concluding um, by 19, the early 1920s or at the very least um, by World War II. And that there is this linear narrative of arrival, acclimation, and assimilation from immigrants to American born to third generation and fourth generation. And so these very neat accounts of uh, the phenomena of Italian immigration to the United States um, leaves out the story of uh, people arriving from Italy to, to the United States from 1945 to present. And if it does so, it only does it in passing, kind of mentions it as a footnote or kind of just sort of at the tail end of a larger argument. So in these two volumes, what we're offering is a radical rethinking of the historical periodization of Italian immigration to the United States. And um, our books push back against such framing of the Italian immigration story. And beyond the periodization, we argue for the continual migration, more or less, of Italians to the United States and how it significantly impacted first the Italian American community, but also the larger US society. Um, and we see what happening with Italian immigration from 45 to, pre to present as a rebooting Italian uh, immigration, uh, a rebooting Italian American culture with this ethnic replenishment that happens uh, from uh, for the past 70 years. And so just two examples that we'll be discussing a little bit at length later on, just to give you a kind of broad overview um, of what we're talking about. One from the first volume, which looks at politics and history, is the idea that Italians and Italian Americans were really instrumental in changing the immigration laws in the United States of the quota system from 1924 to the immigration policy that's currently in, um, in, uh, present in the United States changing that in 1965. So the issues of Italian immigration, Italian Americans' involvement was key to the changes in immigration law. And then the whole notion, just to give you one example of cultural aspect, is the whole notion of authentic Italian food. And so um, food becomes this really important marker of Italian American identity before this 1945 date. Um, 
But what happens in, in the 70s, as we talk about with Marcella Hazan and uh, uh, Lydia Bastianich and many others, the whole notion of what constitutes Italian food, real Italian food, in quotation marks, um, is really a turning point um, that's brought about by a new wave of Italian immigration uh, after 45. Hi, everyone. And I wanted to start actually just first by echoing Joseph's uh, comments of appreciation about being able to present our books here at Casa, just to also say that this is my first time speaking at Casa Italiana. So I, I've always sort of seen what, what, you all, what you do here from afar, from California, and it's wonderful to be here in particular and to be able to present this project in particular. And what I wanted to turn to is to talk a little bit about some basic information, historical, that many of you here probably know, but just to kind of review a little bit where we're at. When we talk about immigration since 1945 uh, from, from Italy to the United States, what numbers are we talking about? And what are some of the laws in particular that influenced the amount of Italians who came here in the last 70 years? So we all probably know, and, and um, Stefano reminded us of the mass period of Italian migration in the early 19th century. And if we look at the earliest uh, kind of data of Italian immigration from like 1869 through to 2005, we can see that um, the history of the country is really one of a near continuous migration. So that from 1869 to 2005, more than 28 and a half million Italians left Italy. That's an enormous number. And so we really have to think about what, how we identify Italy as a country, how we understand its history through thinking of migration. And if we just then focus in on the first period after the Second World War, the first 30 years after 1945, we know that over 7 million Italians left their hometown in the first 30 years after, after World War II. That might mean they went from southern Italy to the north, that northern Italy. That might mean they went to Belgium, to Australia, to Canada, to Argentina. So of those 7 million, only about a half a million came to the United States. So this relatively modest number um, of Italians emigrating to the United States after the war, we argue has really less to do than what was happening in Italy and almost everything to do with laws in the United States. And today, when we think about laws, uh, immigration laws here in the United States, the conversation around immigration especially very recently, tends to be about Italian, or tends to be about immigration from non-European countries, right? And what, what is currently being debated here in the United States, the immigration laws, some of those laws that are currently being debated, are in fact laws that were put into effect um, in, uh, in the decades after the Second World War precisely to help Southern and Eastern Europeans. And it's a fact that I think is we think is pretty much little known and that we really see our uh, books kind of participating in a larger conversation today and debates around immigration in the United States as well as in Italy. And the, the most significant law that affected this pretty modest number of immigrants who came to the US after the Second World War was in fact a law from the 1920s, the Johnson and Reed Act or the Nationality Act of 1924 that restricted immigration by nation. Sometimes it's known as the quota law. Um, and with this, in the case of Italians, uh, this, this quota law meant that uh, 3,845 Italians could come to the country, come into the U.S. every year. And this law, the quota law, remained into effect until 1965. And importantly, it was Italian Americans, among others, who really helped change the, the, the quota law. And this masthead here is for an organization called the American Committee on Italian Migration, or ACIM which was founded in 1952 expressly to eliminate the national quota system and to help Italians exiting Italy and, and kind of their settlement here in the United States. And ACIM had local chapters all across the United States. It was very active in a number of different Italian-American uh, communities to help lobby for change. 
And a couple of the essays in our first volume talk specifically about Achi and about a number of other ways that players in both the United States and in Italy, from government officials to NGOs, really worked to change and um, not only to eventually overturn the quota system law, but to uh, help develop other s smaller laws that really helped the exit of Italians um, after the Second World War. And even uh, before the law was changed, so from 1945 until 1965, Italians found a number of ways to kind of work around the limiting quota law. And that was done through other series of laws that went into effect, sometimes uh, through the lobbying effects of Achim. So there were laws like the War Brides Act of 1946, the Displaced Persons Act of 1948, and the Refugee Relief Act of 1953 that all assisted in various ways of getting Italians, uh, f finding different ways for them to either reunite with their families, who were some families who were already here in the US, or to um, otherwise uh, exit Italy and enter and settle in the United States. Eventually, though, the um, Immigration and National Nationality Act of 1965 passed, and this created a more equal immigration selection process uh, and really abolished this quota, this limiting quota system, national quota system. And what's interesting is that once that 1965 act was changed, we see a, an immediate change in the number of Italians coming to the United States. So again, to throw out a couple numbers for you to, to munch on tonight, um, Italian immigration patterns drastically changed, jumping from in 1965, there were about 10,000 Italians who came to the US. But a year later, after the law had been passed, that number uh, jumped to 25,000 and continued to escalate um, each year into the next decade. And then almost as suddenly as the number spiked after the 1965 law, the number of Italian immigrants to the United States began to decline in the 1970s. So again, we see that in 1970, there were 27,369 Italians who em emigrated to the US. Um, and by 1970, there were only 11,000. And of course, I'm sorry, by 1975, there were only 11,000. And of course, by that time, Italy has seen its own change with the effects of the economic miracle or economic boom that really established a different social and economic reality in Italy and thus started to readjust why or when Italians might be leaving. And one th other factor that we talk about in um, our volumes is that the effect of the economic miracle or the economic boom was, of course, felt in Italy in a number of different ways. And with respect to migration, importantly, we start to see a shift in how kind of the relationship Italy has to migrants generally. So that in 1973, we can see that year as the year that Italy became a destination country for new migrants. So it's the first year that there are more people arriving to Italy from outside of Italy rather than there are Italians leaving. And that status as Italy as more likely an a destination country rather than an emigrant country remained pretty consistent until 2013 when that trend sort of flipped again and the numbers changed and more Italians in 2013 left than uh, new immigrants arrived. And so, and now we're kind of in a, another kind of flux with, if we start to consider the number of refugees who arrive on Italian soil every year, we're gonna see a variety of different numbers um, rather than uh, people who emigrate with an intent to, to settle in the country. But so we, we can kind of see that there's this been this constant sort of trickle at the very least with some periods of more intense migration. And to offer you one last statistic for the, for the time being at least, if we look at the last, the more recent period, so which we will go back to 1979 until now, we can see that only 171,000 Italians have come to the country, to the US from 1979 to the present. So in short, there's been this sort of steady flow of continual migration, 
And uh, Joseph now is going to talk a little bit about kind of how do we categorize and think about this giant period of time of migration into different kinds of groups or periods. So um, in thinking about the three quarters of a million Italians who have come to the United States in the last seven years, we tracked two basic groups. And we will also, to track these groups, looking at his, reading the works of historians, sociologists, and other scholars. And what we came uh, across was this, these two categories of working class community and the elite. This is the, sort of the term that's used by uh, uh, contemporary scholars concerning the, the second group. And we, they're broken down into these two big areas. And we understand that these are slippery concepts. And we don't mean to suggest that all immigrants fit into each one of them um, clearly and um, in one group or the other. But they're useful for looking at uh, the kinds of communities that are arriving. So the working class group are members who arrived primarily from 1945 to 1973. They, may, they are mainly from the southern regions of Italy. They arrive more or less with skill or trade, and they remain in the skilled labor force um, uh, in the United States. And they possibly enter the middle class much more quickly than their pre-World War II counterparts. Um, we looked at a number of, of different types of things, both histories and sociology, but we also looked at memoir and fiction. And one of the things that we had read in, in pulling together these two volumes and the introductions in particular was a memoir by um, a colleague of ours, Mario Mignone, from Stony Brook um, uh, University in, in, in Long Island. And he wrote this wonderful memoir of how his family came after World War II. And in, in uh, World War II, basically at the end of the 1950s, it was a family of six or seven, the mother, the father, and, and several children. And he says that by the early 60s, in just a matter of five, six years, they were able to buy a new car, a new house, and to achieve the American dream, right? And so this is something that took several generations to happen for those immigrants who arrived in the late 19th century and early 20th century. And a lot, of course, a lot of the ability of um, uh, immigrants like Mario Mignoni and others to achieve that middle class success was the kind of help that they got from organizations like ACHIM, who met them at the, um, at the docks, met them at the airports, set them up with houses, set them up with um, jobs, who helped um, with their uh, paperwork and other legal matters and help to create um, a kind of assistance and a, a, a network that didn't exist in the early 20th century. So in many cities, they helped revitalize the Italian component of older neighborhoods whose residents were moving, the Italian-American residents were moving to the suburbs. So they reinvigorated things like Catholic parishes, social clubs, religious processions, and other local institutions. And here in New York City, we, we know that that happened in places like Williamsburg, Brooklyn, where I reside, which saw a real big change after World War II as people were leaving. But then there was this new influx of working class Italian-Americans. Places like Bensonhurst, uh, Carroll Gardens, again, was shifting in different ways and the demographics um, at that moment brought in a new wave of Italian immigration, working class immigrants, and helped to uh, solidify the sort of Italian character of those neighborhoods. Um, but the arrival of post-World War immigrants from Italy were also sometimes met with uh, prejudice by their Italian American, American born counterparts who hurled epithets and uh, that they were, that were once directed at them. And we hear a number of stories of accounts of how Italian Americans um, sort of look disparagingly at the new Italian immigrants who are arriving. But ultimately, ultimately these, Italian immigrants, these Italian immigrants become part of the Italian American community and help to solidify kind of an Italian American identity in, in a number of communities throughout the United States. So the new arrivals uh, uh, were caught in the confluence of racial politics at the local and national levels in the United States. And their own identities as whites, um, as Italian Americans, were shift as Italian Americans were shifting into a more firmer position of whiteness at, um, at the, in the post-civil rights era and the white ethnic revival. Some of you may be familiar with the history of Italian Americans and other white ethnics. They, while they enjoyed all the privileges of whiteness, they were able to vote, they were able to own property, they were able to marry whomever they wanted. They weren't always 
seen as fully white. There was a sort of ambiguous whiteness to um, Italian uh, immigrants in the turn of this 20th, 20th century. But by the time World War II happens with uh, Italian Americans serving in the, in the army, um, advancing with the GI Bill, and um, the civil rights movement taking in place, Italian Americans along with other uh, white ethnics uh, take on the mantle and uh, buy into the notion of white ethnicity. So these new immigrants arrive and they don't have to kind of contend with this sort of ambiguous racial status that had plagued Italian immigrants and Italian Americans before. So many working class Italian immigrants settled in urban areas, pre-established Italian American neighborhoods as I mentioned, which were simultaneously experiencing migration and resettlement by other groups such as African Americans and Latinos. Uh, in New York City, it's Puerto Ricans and California, and in, in places like Chicago, it's also Mexicans. Um, these Italian immigrants quickly found themselves caught up in the turbulent and often violent racial politics of the time, and impacted by, and, and they were impacted by and in, um, participated in the notion of defending their neighborhoods against the perceived threat of color. And so these are one of the aspects that, you know, for all intents and purposes, the literature has not looked at. The literature of Italian American studies scholars have, look, have, have produced, um, urban studies scholars looking at Italian Americans and other white ethnic, ethnics miss this whole notion of new arrivals from Italy and their relationship to the changing demographics of urban space. So here we have the designers Massimo and Leila Vignelli, who passed away not too long ago. And we use them as kind of a model for this other category of Italian immigrants who come to the United States and this notion of an elite uh, group of people, professionals for the most part. And so they are arriving more or less from 1974 to the present day with college degrees in hand or with the intention of receiving them. Um, soon afterwards and can be generally understood as a more professionally intended migration that often journalistically is referred to as la fuga dei cervelli or the brain drain. And one of the things that we noted as we were pulling together the books and our introduction is that often these these individuals um, that are of a professional nature are never um, written about or embrace the idea of being an immigrant. So you'll see people will take, a professor will become um, a member of a university. Um, a scientific medical researcher will take a position at an at a institution, or a uh, orchestra conductor will take up the baton um, at the Chicago Symphony, but they never immigrate. And even though they spend the rest of their lives here, they die here, they're never sort of categorized in the same way as the working class immigrants from 45 to 73 are categorized in the same way. So they left and are still leaving in Italy with, uh, with uh, that, uh, in an Italy that was more that is more economically stable and that was in the that was and is the destination more and more for new immigrants. Their departure is marked by more pronounced uh, socioeconomic distinctions. So the arrival of elite immigrants were met by Italian immigrants somewhat differently, as you can well imagine, by the Italian working class that came right after the war for World War II um, because of their class, their education, and their new vision of Italy. One more, that's right. So this is a, um, a panel from 2009 exhibit in search of new life from the Muse Museo Italo Americano in San Francisco. And you can see some of these, um, the, the individuals that are highlighted of this sort of professional elite immigration. And of course, they um, arrived with PhDs in musicology, PhD degrees from the Universita di Roma, La Sapienza, doing research in um, science. They are uh, found, founders of, um, of companies. And this notion of sort of presenting them and presenting Italian-American identity and Italian-American uh, immigrants in a kind of new light, in a new sort of esteemed and highly privileged way is, I think, very indicative here in um, uh, this panel from the exhibit. It's important to note, however, that in recent years there's been also an uptick of Italians residing in the United States without legal status. And one journalist estimated that in 2013 that 150,000 Italians found themselves in this precarious state in the United States. So it's something to sort of keep in mind. Of course, Italians are able to, um, as whites, as Europeans, are able to um, 
come in under the radar, so to speak, while other communities are uh, chastised and uh, seen in a more negative light. So in addition to these kind of more sociological or demographic kind of distinctions, we also spent some time in the books talking about terminology and kind of theorizing and conceptualizing this period of time. And uh, some of that can be kind of understood through this Facebook post from last year. So I'll just read the first line here. Dad and I are going to a Christmas party tonight on the Upper East Side, tonight with real Italians. As soon as he walks in, all the Italian chicks go nuts. So the phrase that we're, we were interested in here is real Italians. And this is a, a word, a phrase, both in English and the Italian version of it, un italiano vero, or even like un italiano italiano, you know, an Italian Italian versus an Italian-American or some other kind of an Italian, um, is, a, is a, a series of phrases that we came across a lot. We came across it in examples like this, kind of more anecdotal, but we also came across it in journalism. We came across it in some scholarship, the little bit of scholarship that is out there in, from this, the last 70 years of migration. And in all cases, um, among the things that it defines was only immigration since 1945. We, we don't see the term real Italian ever being used with earlier waves of immigration from before second, the Second World War. And in addition to that are some things that some of you here may kind of understand already by the term, is that it, the, the, the term kind of connotes this very firm association with, to Italy, to Italian culture, to Italian language, to Italian history. A, a sense of whatever the contemporary moment is in Italy, it suggests a very cl close and almost intimate uh, re connection and, and association with that. And so that it becomes, especially in the last 30, 40 years, it becomes more and more associated with that elite immigrant group that Joseph was referring to. And really that it becomes a way to distinguish uh, between each new wave of migration and especially recognize this kind of elite immigrant group who rarely, though on occasion it happens, but who rarely consider themselves immigrants and rarely consider themselves Italian Americans, even after perhaps spending their entire life in the United States. And this kind of perceived kind of cultural divide between new immigrant, new Italian immigrants and Italian Americans, you know, existed in the post-war era, but really became much more powerful and visu visible um, in the 1970s. Was sort of escalated um, through, by, exacerbated by class distinctions that came to be more clear in the 1970s, and then really, really escalated in the kind of post, uh, in, in our current era, this sort of um, 20, era of the 21st century with the arrival of more and more professional immigrants who arrive with a higher level of education, with a more, um, a more cleaner association or more uh, direct association with Italian high-end <coughs> consumer culture, consumer goods, uh, uh, wealth, and a general sense of an elite culture that they're kind of bringing with them along with their own person. And the kind of consequences of this real or perceived distinction between the real Italians and the Italian Americans um, is something that continued to be, you know, be perpetuate a distinction between each new wave of migration and really perpetuate a, dis a distinction between new immigrants and pre-established Italian Americans, even as the two groups meshed and, and kind of overlapped more and more and more and intermingled more and more. And the former term, the real Italian term, is always a term associated with privilege in different ways, with this kind of marked identity of, uh, that is away from and disassociated from narratives of migration and narratives of working class culture. And, um, and so, and in addition to that kind of problematizing of the term, we're also kind of interested in thinking about the term with respect to what's happening in Italy today, the term real Italian becomes all the more complicated when you think about new waves of migrants to Italy today who often really struggle if, to, to gain Italian citizenship, for instance, um, even if they're born in Italy. And so that 
this idea of like who gets to be called a real Italian is something that we're really interested in thinking through even more and that we sort of lay down some of the basics of that in this, in this book. We, we make the case as well in the introductions to the two volumes um, that it was not only people who came to the United States, um, but also a certain kind of Italian style. Uh, and that very, and this is very much associated with this, again, with this idea of the Italiano Italiano or the real Italian. And this Italian style was first noticeable uh, through the importation of fashion and design. Um, and various for forms of entertainment and other habits of kind of everyday life and has become more and more connected to an Italian kind of na national or nation-oriented migrant rather than a paese-oriented uh, migrant. And um, this kind of globalized sense of an Italian identity is so much tied up with commodity and the commodity of things Italian, the kind of made in Italy brand and the doc brand that becomes really is imported or we argued really is another form of migration. And that has um, was first seen in the 60s and 70s with people like Sofia Loren or Luciano Pavarotti or even Mario Andretti, the race car driver, um, but can also be understood in, a more, in our more contemporary period with things like everything from the slow food movement uh, to you know, the fiat uh, cars um, importation and um, to, of course, leading science and technology professionals that are really branding themselves as Italian as part of their identity. Uh, as uh, Joseph mentioned at the beginning of our talk, food is something that is central as well, and kind of food culture. And one of our essays in the second volume talks specifically about the way Italian immigrants kind of reconfigured notions uh, of and interpretations uh, of food culture, especially people like Marcella Hazan and Lydia Bastianich, who arrived in the United States without any formal training around food and really became very prominent figures in a global interest in Italian food and food culture. And that there, the careers of women like Hazan and Bastianich are part of this kind of general development in the post-war decades of a kind of a fashionable, sought-after form of Italian identity, and one that, importantly, the pre-established Italian-American communities and individuals also kind of tapped onto as a way to align their sense of an ethnic of their ethnic identity as well, um, to associate it more and more with this elite culture and this elite sense of Italian prestige of things Italian or the the made in Italy impact. And so the new exported Italian style was sort of embodied and enacted in across very many different products and uh, objects and events and, and people, and really crisscrossed, as, as our books look at in some instances, the, the Atlantic in multiple ways. And um, this is just a little another kind of suggestive example of some of the, these ideas. This is a um, contemporary photographer, Michele Petruziello, who takes uh, contemporary uh, Italian migrants to the US, in this case, a videographer and a um, psychologist, and kind of dresses them in 19th century costume and kind of places them in the middle of New York City to really kind of comment on and, and think about this continual wave of migration and, and how the various um, moments of immigration are intertwined in various ways. And these are really just, we've been talking about just some of the very broad strokes that we talk about and that are represented in the two volumes. And what we'd like to do now is to spend a little bit of time telling you about two specific uh, research examples. In addition to editing and kind of managing both volumes and writing the introduction to both volumes, Joseph and I in our, collectively did that, but then each on our own uh, did research on two specific topics. So we're going to introduce those now briefly. So um, my chapter looks at a very unique commercial radio program that linked Italian-American families with their relatives in Italy during the post-World War II era that helped to maintain a transatlantic emotional and intimate ties 
La Grande Familia, the big family, was a 15-minute radio station that aired from 1948 to 1961 on WOVAM, a New York City station with extensive Italian language programming. And this is some, a, um, an advertisement from a radio magazine. As you can see, um, I always listen to uh, WOV, how come? Because it is the voice of a friend who comforts me, who entertains me, and who gives me sort of gentle moments of nostalgia. Uh, La Grande Familia was an ingenious marketing campaign devised for the, by the company Progresso Italian Food Corporations, and I'm sure some of you are still aware of Progresso Foods, um, that would, with proof of purchase for products, have a Rome-based representative drive to Italian-Americans' hometowns to record their mundane family news, their chastisements and pleas, and their heartfelt expressions of love and longing. And the, the Grande Familia was a really key marketing device for uh, Progresso Foods as it shifted into a more national, um, uh, a national market. And they also had some things that, they were, that were going on with, um, not Italians, but Italian Americans, but with American, um, uh, American English language marketing. So here you see Giuliano Gerbi. He is the, the Rome correspondent. He's based in Rome. He is, uh, this is a um, undated and um, the, the location is unknown. This was, I obtained this uh, wonderful photograph from his nephew in Milan. So these messages from, were, from afar were in turn broadcast twice daily for all to hear. And given WOV's extensive and syndicated network, La Grande Familia was also heard in New Britain, Connecticut, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Miami, Florida, and Pasadena, California. After airing the messages, representatives of the program mailed 78 RPM recordings of the broadcasted, broadcasted message to each individual families that requested these recordings. And in the course of a decade, it was reported that half a million families in the United States had participated in this unique transnational communication project. So my article looks at six unlabeled and undated 10-inch 78 RPM acetate records from my pa parents personal collection that were made approximately in 1955 to 19, uh, 1952 to 1955. And I, I, not knowing what the technical capabilities are, I haven't brought the actual audio clips. But let me show, share with you a, a brief um, a transcript um, there in Italian and the translation in English. This is um, actually from my paternal grandmother sent to um, her son and his wife. Um, the Joseph in the quote is me. And just to give you a kind of sense of the, um, just one of the types of kinds of messages that were included in these six recordings. It's not the only, so there's a, a different types. And so what I did is I historicized the recordings as part of a continuation of communication among the Italian diaspora, and more specifically through the narratives of my parents and their respective families, whose migration history spanned both pre and post World War II um, immigration waves, and in fact, my paternal grandmother had resided in New York City in the 1920s where my father was born and then they returned um, to Italy to experience fascism and World War II. They got out of the United States just in time. Um, I also examined the recorded message textual content and attempt to understand them from their original social and transnational context. So there's a lot of family history that I work into the article, but then also do a kind of very close reading of the texts themselves. So ultimately, my goal was to reveal in ways in which intimacy for these individuals were created, reestablished, and maintained sonically across the geographic divide that separated them via media process that was informed by and relied on a continual migration of Italians to the United States. And so they're very much concerned, a lot of these messages are concerned with the notion of don't forget that we are here. Um, in fact, one of um, my father's um, a cousin says, don't forget that you have relatives here. 
And because you have to keep in mind, this is right after World War II. Um, in, the, in the mid 1950s, my parents, as many Italian Americans, were sending remittances, they were sending medicine, they were sending clothing um, back to their relatives. So it was an important way of communicating um, across this great divide. The transatlantic disembodied voices, La Grande Familia listeners, heard in New York City and in Pittsburgh and in Miami um, and in Pasadena were not only those of family members, but of similar Italian American families with similar dilemmas, aches, dramas, and dreams, and desires. So you'd turn on the radio and you might hear your family once every two or three years, but you were hearing other people with a ver literally the same messages. Don't forget us, so-and-so just had a baby. Um, uh, we, we miss you so much. Why aren't you writing? We need you to write. We, don't, we miss you, we miss you, we miss you. Continual um, um, uh, stories of very same um, stories that are being told over and over. So the Italian American's diasporic identities and conditions were broadcast for all to hear in an ensemble of voices that en enhanced the acoustic community of diasporic Italians. So uh, I look at a different kind of mass media. I do a lot of work in film studies. And, and so my interest here was, uh, my question was, what did Hollywood do with these immigrants? How did Hollywood represent them, if at all? And I kind of went in asking that question and, and came out with, with some answers here and explored how two somewhat competing themes that are represented by these two images come to be the, the way, the lens through which Hollywood captured this, the immediate post-war Italian immigration to the US. And my focus really was on those immediate decades. And um, here to the left, we have the movie poster for a film that Anna Magnani made, one of four films she filmed in the US. This is one was called Wild as the Wind. She plays a kind of mail order bride to Anthony Quinn, an Italian American. And she goes to live in Nevada, in Reno, Nevada. And her, uh, even before she arrives, she's described as a hot-blooded Italian. And <laughs> So this idea of the stylish, uh, she has no shawl on her head and, and kind of cross around her neck. She has, she's a modern woman and sort of a stylish and passionate woman is one way that we see repeated in this immediate post-war era of, of how Italian immigrants are represented. And on the other side is um, the book cover uh, for a book written by Alfred Hayes, who had been an American GI in Italy. Uh, the Girl on Via Flaminia, that was eventually made into a movie called uh, Teresa, starring Pierre Angeli, about a, male, uh, about a war bride. And in, in there, uh, Teresa is, is a very destitute young woman, and Italy comes to be, and the Italian immigrant comes to be re understood and identified through the scars of the Second World War. And is equally sexually available, but she's also heavily sort of destitute and desperate because of the Second World War. And so what I found that is again and again, Hollywood kind of fashioned a stereotype that we understand very well today of the, of the uh, exoticized and erotic Italian American woman. That that image is not one that we see in films before the Second World War. It doesn't exist. We have lots of stereotypes around Italian American women in Hollywood before the Second World War, but those stereotypes are around domesticity, around uh, motherhood, around religion, around family, but not around sexuality and sex. And instead, uh, by looking at the films made in the U.S. in the first couple of decades after the Second World War, we see that Hollywood, first of all, kind of capitalized, especially on Italian performers who, who kind of casually spent some time in the U.S. Um, and came um, and made, made films here. And they also kind of ca uh, capitalized on the, the, um, the neediness of the country of Italy and the kind of concept of it as a very desperate and destitute country. And so with the shadow of the war on both the production of the film in various ways that I, I won't get into now, as well as the themes within them, the US produced films turned Italian actors such as Anna Magnani and Sofia Loren and Pierangeli into various kinds of kind of hypersexualized immigrant characters. 
They were provocatively out of place war orphans, such as this in this uh, noir set in San Francisco, uh, The Midnight Story. They were um, nannies, such as um, in this romantic comedy, maybe some of his more familiar to some of you, where Sophia Loren pretends to be a war refugee. She's actually the daughter of a kind of elite immigrant, of a, a, a conductor, an orchestra conductor. And she pretends to be a war refugee so that she can get a job as, a na as an immigrant nanny so that she can really connect, you know, hook up with um, Cary Grant. So, um, but nonetheless, she's this just, her passions are completely unleashed. And importantly, in this film, as, as well as in all of them, the immigrant, the female immigrant character doesn't get along with anyone else, doesn't kind of, there's no place for her in, in the US. She's not really, she doesn't get along with the other Italian Americans. She doesn't get along with kind of mainstream um, Americans as well. Another example is, um, this immigrant prostitute played by Valentina Cortese in a movie um, called Thieves Highway, also set in Nevada and California. And uh, just a, a final example out of others that I talk about of the Teresa, the war bride. And in each case, as these and many others, uh, the Italian immigrant women of the post-war era are kind of sexually willing, they're exotic, they're othered through this visual and narrative emphases on their bodies, on sexual abandon, on illicit behavior. And Hollywood kind of presented Italian immigrant characters as alienated from others in the United States and needy and desperate in light of Italy's post-war economic and political instabilities. And together, these images really create and reinforce a particular stereotype that's, that's, that was, is connected to other forms of popular culture and commodity culture, but is really highlighted and heightened by Hollywood. And um, that, of course, also um, come to be very connected to the kind of popularity of things Italian by the time we get to the 1970s and we have a kind of white ethnic revival where it's, it's very hot to be Italian and these images help persuade that idea, help reinforce that idea. So this is a, a very broad overview of what, what I do, uh, how I capture this kind of period of time within Hollywood cinema and think about what was kind of on the ground, what was popular culture doing, and how were they kind of changing their representation of Italian Americans through this new wave of Italian immigrants in the immediate post-war era. And we, we continue to see this, we could sort of track this model of connecting rec a recent wave of Italian immigration to this kind of sexualized female identity up until the contemporary moment as well. And so what we've done tonight is given you a very brief overview of what a lot of what we capture in, the, in our book, some of the scope and the depth of these two volumes. And we really hope that the volumes uh, will spark a lot of new interest and importantly, we hope new scholarship we end uh, the second volume's introduction with a kind of list of, of questions we have of where we think we hope the scholarship will go and what kind of unanswered questions are, st are still out there for work to be done. So we um, encourage that scholarship and we look forward to dialoguing with all of you with any questions you have as well. But thank you. <clears throat> Pull the chairs up and yeah. Sure. Can you comment, please, on the preservation of the language and the difference between the pre-45 and the after-45 communities? I mean, the preservation of the language among the communities with the difference between the pre-45 and after-45 commerce, immigrants and commerce. Yeah. Uh, we, we talk a little bit about um, a number of, especially in the more recent wave with the elite, the so what we're calling the elite immigrant group, the number of schools, for instance, that have been developed uh, throughout the United States, especially for young children, for toddlers and preschool and elementary school and talk about, in some cases, those schools have developed in 
in conjunction with some older generation of Italian Americans. And in other cases, they're really very much uh, detached from those Italian American communities. But we look at examples uh, in Boston, in North Carolina, in San Francisco, and in New York a little bit so that we there there certainly has been that that's something that's very been very prominent and also when you realize that especially the the post anything after 1970s the kind of um, image of knowing a language other than English in the US has shifted so that it's it's now okay it's been okay now for the last 40 plus years to to speak more than one language in the United States. And so since that sort of political perspective has changed, that happens to coincide with this elite immigrant group who arrived kind of ready and willing and interested in supporting lang in Italian language in their children, for instance, and in their community. In the, in the mass period. My impression is that many of the elite, what you're calling elite now, are maintaining a, a stronghold both in Italy, many of them have homes there, they go back every year, unlike the others that do not. Uh, do you have any figures on that? Have, do you have any research on that? We don't have any figures on that. I mean, this is a, an area that, I've, that people are beginning to do look, uh, look at more closely. Um, it is true that the elite immigrants do have this kind of more this transnational aspect but as you as you said the pre-world war ii immigration 50 percent they came to the united states with the intention of going back of making enough money and being able to buy land and property so they've this this back and forth this transnationalism of italian immigrants has been been part has characterized italian immigration from the very get-go um in, in argentina as you may some of you may know they characterized italians as swallows they would go and harvest in latin america and then they'd go back to to italy and harvest there um, we know of a number of people even from the working class community um, who came in 45 to 73, that period, who still have homes, who return, um, and uh, maybe not to the same degree as Italian elites or those who are, um, took up work in, in Germany or Switzerland, Switzerland, but the statistics we don't, we don't have for you, and the figures. Are they available? Because I've done some work on that earlier period, and I know that the U.S. Department of Well, one thing that oh, go ahead. One thing that we talk about in general is that a lot of the fi even the figures that I gave you at the beginning of our talk, a lot of those figures we we don't know really. Like for instance, Joseph's family, his parents, since they were born in the U.S., it's not clear that they're really even noted in some of the, in the numbers. So. When we think about, the, and since the law changed, the citizenship laws changed between the Italy, and the Italy and the US in the late 80s, that means that a lot of Italians, both of the so-called elite period, but also of the working class period, have dual citizenship. And so it becomes very complicated to try to track that kind of movement, because people might leave the country as, with their US passport, enter Italy with their Italian passport, and, yeah. And I was just going to say simply, there are scholars in Italy who are doing this work, and I'm thinking in particular Matteo Pratelli, who was uh, a Tiraseno fellow here at NYU. Um, he's been doing work on um, repatriation, um, and I don't know exactly what period. I think he's actually looking all the way back from the 19th century to the 21st century. Matteo Pratelli. Thank you. Would you talk a little bit about the role of religion, its stronghold now and then? Sure. Um, one of the things we alluded to very briefly was the idea that, especially in the uh, 45 to 73 with the working class um, arrival, one of the things that happened was as the neighbor, especially in places, urban centers, where the, uh, sh the Italian American community began moving out to the suburbs, were moving to other parts of the city and, and cities and elsewhere, the, um, the arrival of these new immigrants really reinvigorated um, 
church, church parishes and um, religious processions. And one of the things that, again, to allude back to the work that we've done here at NYU, uh, several years ago we, um, we um, organized an exhibit of religious banners of Italian societies, lay religious societies in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Many of these uh, organizations were started in the 1880s, but they began to wane um, after World War II. And it was this new wave of um, immigrants from Campania that reinvigorated the Italian processions that are still taking place in that neighborhood. So I think that they've been really key to, um, to, uh, to maintaining an Italian identity to uh, Catholic parishes. That, of course, is changing now. Um, for a number of different reasons. Uh, arrival of new Catholic immigrants, the, those Italian immigrants, World War II, post-World War II immigrants, moving on to the suburbs, returning to Italy, moving to the Sun Belt and what have you. So we know of a number of, and this is of course coinciding with the Catholic Church, closing numerous parishes because of financial reasons pri primarily, but also because of diminishing um, parishioners of those churches uh, being phased out. A, a colleague of mine, Anthony Scotto, who's here, just be bemoaning the fact of St. Rosalia Church in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, was recently demolished. It was this old Italian immigrant parish. And despite the change of the neighborhood um, to Latino Catholics, um, that church was demolished. So it, it's an important part. We talk about it uh, briefly in our introductions. There's no one specific chapter that looks at our religion, um, but it's one of the things that we call out for for more scholarship. So this is the right time to pitch the presentation. Ah, here at the conference. I will be here. Thank you. Um, I forgot about that book. Um, I'll be here in December. I don't remember the exact date. The 5th, December 5th, presenting my book called Built with Faith, Italian-American Imagination and uh, Catholic Material Culture in New York City, which looks at folk art, vernacular art, like yard shrines, Christmas creches, religious processions of Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And I do discuss in there the role of new immigrants um, after World War II in the, just as I was saying, this reinvigoration of Italian um, Catholic life on the ground in in various neighborhoods. December 5th. Thanks. Yes, quick question yeah. um, and a comment. Uh, I didn't catch the, I, sorry. I didn't catch the number of Italians who are leaving Italy in recent years, per year. It's now, uh, I think the last figures. I, the, you, you've ranked, you ranked it as number eight in oh. the world for uh, people yeah. living? These are data that I got from an article in Il Sole 24 Ore, and they're approaching 200,000. Mm -hmm. So the, now the number of Italians emigrating, leaving Italy to go to other places, have, has reached the numbers of immediately after World War II. Uh, huh. And uh, this trend has and started in 2008, I believe, to and, and now basically the about 200,000 200,000 every year 200,000 200, mostly to Europe every, every to different destinations the United States is no longer neither the favorite not on the top right. um, destinations also because of uh, problems with uh, immigration issues it's very easy for Italians to emigrate to any European country because right. they don't, they're not even emigrated technically Yes. Yeah. Because you have all the rights of other citizens. Right. There is an issue with England now because of Brexit, and there are lots, especially of young people uh, that uh, live, work, or study in England, that will have to pay some sort of adjustment. Um, so it's uh, England, Germany a lot, uh, France, Belgium, Australia, Australia. Uh, Australia. in Europe, and then uh, Australia, some mm -hmm. parts of, of Latin America. And then a, a comment. Uh, you mentioned that there had not been very much in the way of depictions of Italians protect, you know, as becoming white and then protecting their turf, if you will, from uh, people of color. Of course, there's the Bronx Tale, right, which is a very visual representation of that. There's definitely work looking at, there's another, uh, Jonathan Ryder wrote a book, a wonderful book, important book, um, called Canarsi. Um, the Jews and Italians against liberalism. But one of the things that he doesn't um, really look at is the role of post-World War II Italian 
um, immigrants in that conversation and in that, that those actions on the ground. But if you look at some New York Times articles from the 1960s, 1970s, they're talking about this new wave of Italian immigrants who are um, uh, settling first in places like East New York, right? There's the Brownsville and Harlem. Um, as those, those older Italian communities are beginning to shift and their role in, these are journalistic articles, in their role in defending turf. But in these larger studies that look at um, um, this issue, the role of new immigrants doesn't really seem to play a factor. I have two questions. One is um, the pecking order of the northern versus southern Italians. Did that uh, come over to the United States both before 1945 and after 45? Yeah, um, well, definitely was there before 1945, and it continued a little bit after 1945 as well. The working class immigrants were mainly, in the immediate post-war era, were mainly from the South, and that has a lot to do with the fact that there were kind of chain migration uh, models that allowed them to emigrate and so so many of them were coming and kind of reunifying with family that had come before the Second World War but in the more contemporary era the last 30 years or so we don't see in there that same kind of uh, distinction made as much but certainly the if you're talking about the more general sense of like the pre general prejudice of, of southerners versus northerners, that has continued in Italy still today, and so it continues anywhere there are, anywhere in the diaspora. Just yeah. A correction. Yeah, go uh, ahead. The simply this dynamic north-south, that until a few years ago had even representation in parliament, the Northern League openly had in its uh, program a vague and never defined idea of secession of the North. Mm -hmm. Then if you mm -hmm. ask 10 different members of the leadership of the Northern League to tell you where the border would be, mm -hmm. you would have <laughs> 10 different answers. So mm -hmm. obviously it was not a viable solution. But south of Rome. But no, no, of no, course I'm them would say the Po River. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, would be out. Uh, some of them would say Flores. I mean, you would really get a variety of interests. But that's besides the point. The point is that their political identity, and I remind you that Peace is now the party that would probably be number one if we had elections tomorrow, and it's part of the government. Part of their political identity was exactly in this juxtaposition between the South and the North. Uh, and very open about that. That the South is the enemy, uh, all the possible stereotypes about Southern Italian that you could imagine, they use them in official political forum, I mean, in the Senate of the Republic, in the chamber. Um, and there was a, a switch that has to do with the issue of immigration. During the last uh, campaign, the leader of the Northern League, first of all, decided to abolish the adjective Northern for League. So now it's only the league. And to cut down the anti-Southern rhetoric and to campaign in cities like Naples and Palermo, and it took guts because he got a lot of name calling uh, when he went to these places. Why? Because now the new enemy <laughs> is not the Southern Italian, is the immigrant. So the new political message of a party that identify itself with the juxtaposition between the North and the South is that, no, now we are all Italians, Italians, that it's a, a category that they would have never used before. They did not want to be Italians. Uh, the leader of the Northern League even said that he would not root for the Italian soccer team at the World Cup. That's heresy. Uh, but uh, they, th that point, they said, we Italians should come before everybody else, and we should all be united against the invasion. So the anti-immigration rhetoric taking over the northern-south mm -hmm. rhetoric. But it's interesting that they always have to identify an enemy and to present the other. But in the 
last round of elections, the enemy had become the immigrant no longer the Southern Italians. And I have to say that it worked. Because many Southern Italians voted for the magically transformed League from Northern League. I mean, this is an interesting, Stefano makes an interesting point um, about the immigrants because one of the things that we suggest, we're hoping for more work is what happens here in the United States when immigrants to Italy or their children then immigrate to the United States, this kind of double immigration. How, is, how are they going to be perceived as Italian? How will they present themselves as Italian? How will they be perceived as Italian Americans? Amar Locus, the writer, um, Who's I, he's yeah. teaching here now? He's here. Is he Italian? Is he Italian American? How? What's his relationship to all these, you know, configurations of identity? And so I think this is a, a real rich area for. Uh, we think that is a rich area for research going forward for this double immigration. So my other question is the use of all the slurs that were uh, created against the Italians, let's say before the war. Did that persist? to the waves after uh, World War II, and what effect did the um, World War II Italians being on the wrong side, the fascist side, have a, an effect on those kind of slurs? Well, one of the uh, chapters in the first volume focuses specifically on Boston, for instance, James Pasto's essay, and he looks at uh, the working class wave and the elite immigrant wave in the same community that was the community that was a pre-established Italian-American community from before the Second World War. So he, in that chapter in particular, as well as in other places in the, in the two volumes, we talk, there's, there's discussion around just that idea and in fact that with each new wave of immigrants who came, there was a lot of prejudice against them from the specifically from the pre-established Italian American so that some of those epitaphs were slayed against the new wave the the same people who would later be called real Italians when they first came to the US especially right after the second world war they were they were those needy desperate poor uh, Italians and so and they and so a lot of the kind of ethnic slurs against them were used we, we can see that again and again. But, it, but it's not so straightforward because within a matter of m days, really, within a matter of sh few short years, that same group would become kind of part of an established group of Italian Americans that then is actually maybe through language lessons, through religion, their relationship to their community through religion, are become the kind of symbols for Italy and Italianness for the community, and so then they are no longer those, those, they're then seen as someone to like help the Italian Americans be almost like be more Italian. We, we cite um, another uh, essay by one of our colleagues, Fred Gardafe, who talks about the arrival of new uh, waves of Italian immigrants in his neighborhood in Chicago in the 50s and 60s, and saying that sure that Along the way, like the Italian Americans became more Italian, sort of just as the new the new wave of Italians became more like us, more more Italian American. So that it it really is a, a two way sort of movement of identity. As far as the effect of the uh, fascist side. Oh right, yeah, um, that's sort of a similar kind of rhetoric that we see again and again in a lot of the literature. We uh, looked at a number of oral stories, for instance, that were captured that are in an archive in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, of uh, oral stories that were done with post-war immigrants. And one thing that really brings them all together is the way in which they're always referencing the Second World War and their experiences during the Second World War. Also, uh, if you look at the creative writing, the literature of uh, post-war immigrants or the children of post-war immigrants especially, you'll see that the memory of having lived through the Second World War or uh, the memory of someone's uh, mother or father having lived through the Second World War kind of imbues the literature, the creative writing, fiction, um, performance, theater, poetry of immigrants and the children of immigrants. And we think, in fact, that's another place that we think the scholarship is kind of lacking, that no one has looked at Italian-American writers who are the children of immigrants in, in this more contemporary period 
and said, well, what, has, what is it about their experiences being the children of post-war immigrants that has affected and kind of influenced their way of, of writing and, and thinking creatively about identity? And the war and the memory of the war is one key way that that comes out. other European nationalities in America? We didn't really track that. I mean, that wasn't something we were looking at. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not a specialist, but I was wondering if you have um, an understanding of uh, of how new technology have shaped differently the identity of the newcomers. Thank you. Uh, we look at this a little bit and kind of uh, tracked, for instance, uh, things like meetups and uh, online social media spaces that have been created by new way, these more recent waves of, of Italian immigrants or Italian kind of the so-called brain drain group um, of immigrants, and um, especially uh, in one of the articles uh, by Teresa Fiore, it looks a little bit at mass media and online media with respect to this new wave. And one argument is that while the uh, earlier waves of immigrants had things like the corner store or the, the town kind of square or neighborhood corner to kind of group meet in and have a community built around or a church that they had a kind of community to build on that now those kind of communities are happening but they're happening online among new immigrants and that they're kind of meeting each other online and then maybe coming together in a space like for instance Casa Italiana or other kind of institutional spaces we look we track a little bit the cases San Francisco and Silicon Valley and here in New York and found for instance the the role the Italian government played is very strong in kind of creating ties among new groups of immigrants through technology uh, in order to do that. What happened if you are forced to cut your um, contact uh, in another country, which was what happening before instead of what, what what's happening now that you can easily reach uh, your friends and through Skype or? Again, we didn't do a, a kind of an analysis of this kind of, um, this kind of um, comparison between pre-World War II communication and post-World War II communication. One of the things I wanted to do with this, uh, my chapter, was look at just the, almost like a continuity of communication between uh, Italian Americans here and Italians um, there, um, while it is no it is no way the same way as you know getting on WhatsApp, getting on Skype, et cetera, et cetera. There has been this kind of continuous communication, first through letters, through photographs, through films in the early 20th century, then with the radio and even television. There's been a kind of continuous. Um, connection, but which has only increased in the, the late, 19, uh, late late 20th century and early 21st century. I think it would be a wonderful study. I think with a lot of the questions that people are asking, we and the other co uh, our colleagues in the uh, books um, make allusions and uh, suggestions of where this work can go uh, moving forward. Um, and we think that there's, you know, much more work to be done. Thank you. Have you done any studies about the association to New York City based on the parts of Italy they're from? Uh, no, we, we haven't done that work. I mean, we, I've looked at, you know, I haven't done a, in my own work, I haven't done a systematic look at all the uh, societies. I, I was much, my interest in the book that I'll be presenting in December here was much more interested in expressive culture and um, the artistry, the religious artistry of various communities, some of which that take place in social clubs and associations. But I didn't track every single um, 
you know, ethnic uh, or regional uh, social club or association. I don't think anybody's done that kind of work. Um, but I, you know, a lot, it's a, they are um, important uh, community venues for identity, for religious work, for social life, for artistic production. And so in, in, in Built with Faith, the other book, does look at some of the ways that those, those venues uh, serve as a source of art, artistry. To follow up to this question, uh, Joe, in the uh, way in which we know that the previous wave of immigration, the Great Immigration 1880, 1920, um, we know that mostly uh, people moved uh, to neighborhoods that became sort of a copy of the region or the city or the neighborhoods of the city uh, they came from. Uh, it's a beautiful introduction that Martin Scorsese has to his uh, documentary on Italian cinema, uh, where he talks about Elizabeth Street and says, we were all from this town. And in the other street, they were all from the next door town, and we couldn't stand each other. <laughs> the building across the street was from another town. So I was wondering, and you know, that was one of the features that is commonly recognized uh, with that kind of immigration. So I was wondering whether the fact that they came through these, many through this network, uh, this Catholic network that you mentioned, repeated that uh, situation of like the people from the same town living in the same building or in the same neighborhood? Not, in the, well, not in the same building, but definitely no. in the same neighborhood as, as Lauda said. I mean, and, and the work that I've, I've done extensive work in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and so there are communities from, Tej from Campania, from Tajano, from Sanza, um, from NOLA and some other regions there. They went there because there was already a community there. And so I always remember a, a, a gentleman I interviewed from Castellamara del Golfo from, um, from Sicily, and he said for him, America was North Fifth Street. He dreamed of going to America, but he knew it as North Fifth Street. And when he came there, uh, he went to North Fifth Street in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. But as I said before, the, the, they were arriving, the post-World War II immigrants were arriving at the same time that other communities, uh, particular people of color, were arriving in New York City. So uh, one of the people that I've worked with, Vincenzo Ancona, was a Sicilian poet. He first went to Williamsburg, Brooklyn, because that's where the Castellamarese went. Then as the neighborhood changed, he moved to Bushwick, uh, Brooklyn. And then as that neighborhood began to change, uh, uh, Sicilians moving, he went to Gravesend, Brooklyn, near um, Bensonhurst and Gravesend. So so they did originally go to these pre, these pre World War II areas of settlement, but as the New York City changed, they began to move as well. And so then, you know, there was then a strong, the Molese, Mola di Bari from Puglia. They all went to Carol Gordon's in South South Brooklyn, and then that neighborhood changed demographically, and many of them moved to to the Bensonhurst area. So they kind of created whole new communities um, elsewhere. Uh, I don't know if, is it possible to have those data from the immigration office, like uh, data about Italian immigration? Can you, can anybody ask for those data or the green card um, lottery data? Do you know that? Well, some of that information is public. It's also available through the census, some of it. But you mean on the U.S. side or the Italian side? Uh, you mean on the, the U.S. side. Yeah. Uh, some of that information is available, but it also requires you s sort of sitting and finding it yourself, not necessarily asking so, someone a question. So it's not and not provided from them. Not in all cases. It depends what your question, what what you're looking like for. Like for decades, for example. You're talking about archival research. I mean, you're, it's I'm not. You're, talking I get, about you, immigration office data. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if you can call up an office and they're going to yeah. like turn around That's and give you the I numbers. Know, but it's like I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Does, it, <laughs> does your research cover any influence that the Italian uh, uh, immigrants here in the United States, uh, the influence that they had musically, talking about classic music, opera, symphony, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? We, we don't have a specific uh, chapter that ref refers just to that, but we definitely talk about it in some broad terms in the second volume, and um, specifically with respect to the uh, 
uh, relationship, both to sort of big entertainers who came to the came to uh, the U.S. in the 50s and 60s, and and set through the 70s, especially to some of these very strong Italian American neighborhoods, but then also to uh, a number of orchestra conductors and symphony uh, members and musicians uh, in classical music and opera who came to the US. So we talk about it in broad ways, but not it's not focused on specifically. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.